Welcome back to This Week in Geology. This is your host, GOS, and I have a bunch of cool articles that we're going to read today. Let's get into it. How often do rainstorms cause debris flows in burned areas of the southwestern United States? Debris flows, sometimes referred to as mudslides, mud flows, lahars, or debris avalanches, are common types of fast moving landslides. They usually start on steep hillsides as a result of shallow landslides or from runoff and erosion that liquefy and accelerate to speeds in excess of 35 miles per hour. The consistency of debris flows ranges from thin, watery to thick, rocky mud that can carry large items such as boulders, trees, and cars. They are among the, the most numerous types of landslides in the world and are particularly dangerous to life and property because of their high speeds and the sheer destructive. In the southwestern US, wildfires and short periods of intense rainfall are both common occurrences. In unburned areas, debris flows are com more, more commonly caused by long-lasting rainstorms or rainfall in areas that are already soaked by previous storms. In burned areas, short bursts of heavy rain over steep terrain can produce debris flows more so than in unburned areas due to changes in ground surface properties from the intense heat of fires. So it's a best linear straight line fit used to calculate 3.9 recurrence interval. So that's obviously how basically the average of how often that occurs it'll occur an average of about four years every four years you'll have one of these intense debris flows due to uh rainfall intensity you know causing huge debris flows in burned areas pretty interesting uh, little article this is something we have not covered yet which is uh geohazards and geohazards well actually we have but not debris flows, not gravity driven debris flows. We've typically just covered volcanism and earthquakes. And in terms of geologic news, you'll notice that it's kind of focused on geohazards. So for the 15 minute rainfall intensity, obviously your rainfall intensity was much was worst here. And this is the amount that you had. So they counted 316 debris flows in the 15 minute intervals. And it was when you had a quarter of an inch to a half an inch, that was when it was the, that was the most abundant. Uh, that's the way I'm reading this. And then you had your RIs, your 30 minute interval, half an inch to an inch, I'm guessing is what this one is. That one is the most abundant. And then 60 minute ra rainfalls, half an inch to an inch is the most abundant amongst 282, 310, 316 debris flows. Keep your mind aware of, if you go camping in a place like the Gila or somewhere in California or somewhere in Utah, you know, you want to make sure that you're not going somewhere where it's burning and you want to make sure you're watching the weather, making sure it's not raining a lot. So the next article is searching for life in NASA's Perseverance Mars samples. When the agency's newest rover mission searched for fossilized microscopic life on the red planet, how will scientists know whether they found it? So NASA's Mars Perseverance rover will be the agency's ninth mission to land on the red planet along with characterizing the planet's geology and climate and paving the way for human exploration beyond, beyond the moon. The rover is focused on astrobiology or the study of life throughout the universe. Perseverance is tasked with searching for telltale signs that microbial life may have lived on Mars billions of years ago. It will collect rock rock core samples and metal tubes and future missions would return these samples to earth for deeper study and they're going to be looking for life and uh basically this is i believe this is called travertine um but yeah this is something we see on earth and they think it's possible possibly in this crater on mars and they're going to take some samples and see if they can find some evidence of life on mars which would be so cool and that would be pretty intense to it would be pretty intense to be alive, you know, during the time when they discover that there's life that existed somewhere else in our universe, which the universe is large. So in my opinion, yes, life does exist somewhere else, but it'd be cool if it was that close Mars. All right. So the next one, USGS again, USGS research spotlight. Subduction may recycle less water than thought. So Dr. Nathan Miller, research geophysicist from the USGS Woods Hole Coastal and Marine Science Center, led a study on new analysis of seismic data from the Middle American Trench, suggesting that previous calculations have vastly overestimated the total amount of water transported to the mantle worldwide. So this research suggests water transport at the Middle America Trench subduction zone is less than previously estimated. Seismic anisotropy measurements 
show that upper mantle hydration at the Mid-America Trench is limited to serpent serpentinization or water in fault zones <laughs> rather than distributed uniformly. The researchers use data collected by seafloor, seafloor seismometers to measure seismic anisotropy along the Mid-America Trench near Nicaragua, which enabled a much more detailed picture of upper mantle hydration. The next article is using earthquake forensics to study subduction from space. So subduction again. Researchers combine satellite geodetic measurements of surface motion with a new geophysical data inversion method to probe the Chilean subduction zone in the wake of the Malé earthquake, the 2010 Malé earthquake. Major earthquakes occur frequently in the subduction zone west of the Andes, the 7,500 kilometer long mountain belt that runs along the Pacific coast of South America. These earthquakes have been documented since the early expeditions of Alexander von Humboldt and Charles Darwin. Despite all that has been learned through uh, countless investigations across this region over the past few decades, Earthquake science and space-based observations can still tell us much more as we await the next big one. In particular, detailed knowledge of Earth's structure, state of stress, and seismically active regions is critical for understanding the controls on earthquake generation and for improving hazard assessment preparation and response. This knowledge can be obtained using a variety of field-based instrumental and experimental techniques. The next article is called, and this is from NASA, a short journey to the center of the Earth. So beneath Earth's crust lies 2,900 kilometers or 1,800 miles of viscous mineral and rock known as the mantle. Famous and fanciful literature aside, no human is likely to visit the mantle or deep interior of Earth, but at Gross Morn National Park, people can step on fragments of the mantle without having to dig an, it, an inch. On October 3rd, 2017, the OLI operational land imager, I hate acronyms, <laughs> <laughs> on Landsat 8, acquired natural color imagery of Gross Morn National Park. The UNESCO World Heritage Site covers 1,800 square kilometers or 690 square miles in the Great Northern Pen Peninsula of Western Newfoundland. A detailed view of the tablelands in the southern portion of the park is below. Gross Morn provides some of the world's best exhibits of the process of plate tectonics. This park contains a portion of long range mountains of sub range of the Canadian Appalachians that dates back to around 1.2 billion years ago, when present day North America collided with another continent. These mountains have since eroded and left behind the nice, nice, and granite peaks of the long range. The park contains some of the tallest peaks of the long range mountains, including Big Level and Gross Morn Mountain. The table lands located on the south end of the park are considered one of the most striking features. The flat topped rust colored land is rich with peridotite rock from the upper, man upper part of Earth's mantle. The rock was thrust towards the surface around 500 million years ago through a process known as subduction. When two plates on Earth's crust collide, one is often pushed back or subducted towards the mantle. Standing out amid the lush green park, the yellowish red tablelands played a crucial role in confirming the theory of plate tectonics. Peridotite actually is like a greenish black rock and I'll have that pop up. But the fact that it has yellowish red coloration to it, that means it's been weathered. So it's been exposed to the surface for a while. But as we talked about in the last episode of This Week in Geology, peridotite contains a lot of iron. It's obviously been weathered to limonite and hematite. So that's why it has that yellowish red. Pretty interesting. I've always wanted to go to Canada and specifically this part of Canada. I'll, I'll look at it more on Google Earth because these are kind of close images, but you can see the table lands right here. This is where the peridotite has been exposed due to subduction. It, it was thrust upwards uh, due to the subduction processes. And yeah, I bet this area is beautiful. You know, you have glacial valleys created, which are U-shaped in comparison to V-shaped valleys. And then fjords, they're basically just little lakes left behind, if I remember correctly. I don't have a lot of glaciers <laughs> in my part of the country, but yeah, the, I bet this area is beautiful. I can't wait to look at pictures of this for this article. The next article is first humans in Tasmania must have seen spectacular aurora so a small subalpine lake in western tasmania has helped establish that 41,000 years ago australia experienced the last champ geomagnetic excursion and that tasmania aboriginals would have seen it 
Drilling a 270,000 year old core from a Tasmania lake has provided the first Australian record of a major global event where the Earth's magnetic field switched and the opportunity to establish a precedent for developing a new paleomagnetic dating tools uh, for Australian archaeology and paleo sciences. And, and they constantly talk about this occurring and if it were to occur, this, uh, this magnetic field switch, it would basically knock knock out everything we have in terms of our uh, our technology so it would be a bad thing for us now otherwise it wouldn't affect us i don't think this is the first study of this kind in australia since pioneering studies in the 1980s so pretty cool stuff i'll have some pictures you know kind of come up and build a better picture for you guys you know i want to build a better picture so we know what we're looking at i've obviously never looked on looked at tasmania in a uh on google earth so i'm gonna check that out and i'll post i'll have that pop up throughout the article but um yeah this is pretty interesting and it's crazy that 41,000 years ago they can find evidence that you know the the magnetic poles shifted that's that's pretty cool all right so the last article of the day a new clearer insight into Earth's hidden crystals. So geologists have developed a new theory about the state of Earth billions of years ago after examining the very old rocks formed in the Earth's mantle below the continents. Seven continents on Earth today are each, bu each built on a stable interior called the Craton, and geologists believe that Craton stabilization some 2.5 to 3 billion years ago was critical to the emergence of land masses on Earth. Little is known about how cratons and their supporting mantle keels formed, but important clues can be found in peridotite xenoliths, which are samples of mantle that are brought to the surface by erupting volcanoes. So many rocks from the mantle below old continents contain a surprising amount of silica, much more than is found in younger parts of the mantle. There's currently no scientific consensus about the reason for this. Oh, okay. I had to reread that. I read that wrong. So the rocks, you wouldn't expect the peridotite to contain more silica. You would expect it to contain less because of differentiation. So it's interesting that they found more. Interesting. Okay. The new research, which looks at the global data for mantle peridotite, comes up with a new explanation for this observation. The research used a new thermodynamic model to calculate that the unusual mineralogy developed when very hot molten rock greater than 1700 degrees Celsius interacted with older parts of the mantle and this caused growth of silica rich minerals. For more than 1 billion years from 3.8 to 2.5 billion years ago, volcanoes also erupted very unusual lavas of very low viscosity, lava that was very thin, very hot, and often contained variable levels of silica. Our modeling suggests that the unusual lavas were in fact the molten rocks that interacted with the mantle at greater depth and this interaction resulted in the variable level of silica. Both the silica-rich rocks in the deep mantle and the low viscosity volcanic rocks stopped being made by the Earth some 2.5 billion years ago. This timing is the boundary between the Archaean and Protozoic Proterozoic eons, one of the most significant breaks in Earth's geologic timescale. What caused this boundary remains unknown, but the research off offers a new perspective that's the end of this episode i hope you guys enjoyed this particular episode you know some interesting stuff i tried to change it up i initially had a bunch of earthquake again and we've been reading a bunch of earthquake articles i'm gonna try and keep it you know mixed up there's actually a lot of geologic news occurring every week so that's good and you know that's the point of this particular series it's just to for me to learn and for you guys to learn with me so i'll see you on the next one later essentials